in the UK. Can you just put your hands together for the Ream team, the national Ream team. God bless you. Thank you for your hard work over the year as you continue to win souls for the kingdom of God. We want to just give God praise this morning. Can you say hallelujah in the house? Hallelujah. Just touch the person beside you and say, I'm so happy to have you here today. And put one of the biggest smile on your face, man. You woke up this morning, but you woke up in God's grace. So please put a smile on your face, whether you're online, whether you're in the building. Hallelujah. We want to just give God praise. Hallelujah. So without any further delay, do stand for our minister, pastor, who will be leading us into this segment, this morning theme. It's about going. Amen? But you need the power to go, you know. This morning, the theme is, I will go. Can I hear you say that loudly? I will go. If you're online, type in the chat, I will go. Go. That's a personal statement, you know. It means you're making a commitment. So I will go is the theme for this morning session. And to do this is our minister, Hussein Jones. And I'm going to just read a little bit about the man of God and then hand over the mic for his segment. Minister Hussein Jones is a Christian of over 20 years. He is licensed, he's a licensed minister with the United Pentecostal Church of Jamaica for over nine years. He's a graduate of the Caribbean Bible Institute and is now a lecturer at the lecturer at the said institution. He is the immediate past president of the National Conquerors Department of the United Pentecostal Church of Jamaica and is currently serving as home missions director, similarly to Orim here of the said organization. Minister Jones presently serves as pastor of Faith Pentecostal Tabernacle, where he has the humble privilege of serving the people of God. He also serves as school chaplain for Pentab High School. Additionally, he is an internal auditor for the Tax Administration of Jamaica. Guys, you heard that? Amen. <laughs> he loves the Lord and he also loves people. And his greatest pleasure is working in the kingdom. Being ready. Somebody say ready. Ready. Being ready for the coming of the Lord and discipling men and women to fulfilling their God call purpose and being ready to meet their king. He's happily married to one wife, his partner in ministry, who is a medical entomologist. Did I say that right, sir? Medical entomologist in the Ministry of Health, and her name is Shireen Jones. Help me make welcome God's man for this hour. Minister Pastor Jones and the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sister Simba. And praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Let's all lift our hands, just worship the Lord for a moment. Just breathe the name of Jesus, that all powerful name. That saving name, that delivering name, that healing name, that name that caused demons to tremble. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody call that name in the house here this morning. Yes, call that name Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. He deserves all honor. He deserves all glory. He deserves all praise. Amen. Anybody love him today? Anybody love him today? Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. I am very, very delighted and grateful to the Lord to be here with you in your 54th convocation. Amen. 
Clap hands to the Lord for that. Amen. That's a, a great feat. Amen. Some persons as individuals don't live to say 54 years. Praise the Lord. And look what the Lord has done. Amen. Special greetings, of course, to Bishop Devon Brown and all the leaders, all the ministers. God richly bless you, sir. All the pastors. I know several pastors are here. Elder Rowe, God bless you. All the laborers, all God's people, those who are joining us online, special greetings to you as well. So today we are talking about missions. Amen. And as I heard Sister Simba made mention earlier, I have a similar thought at church where I said that missions, everybody's business, right? And missions should be everybody's business. As I'm about to begin, let us pray quickly as we go forward. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy towards us. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your midst and to look, at, look into your words and some concepts that will be critical for our growth, development, and for us to fulfill our purpose. We ask that you touch, we ask that you deliver, we ask that, oh God, you empower me even right now as I seek to share. Let there be clarity of thought, clarity of expression. Let your people, God, be edified, strengthened, and directed here today. And let your name be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. As I, as I look across... And I see directly in front of me a growing church is missions oriented. I look to my right, I see each one reach one. Closer, it is creating a culture of evangelism. And to my left, saving the lost at any cost. And closer, good news, Jesus still saves sinners. Clap your hands to the Lord for that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It is said that we learn by repetition, and I want to commend you as an organization for putting missions at the forefront of the mind, as it were, in the faces of the people. If you remember in the Old Testament, when the Shema hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, it was done repeatedly. When they get up, when they come out, when they get back home, tell them, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, because you want it to stick. You want them to have that. Amen? And so I want to commend you again, and of course, having a day designated for missions. In this day and age, we are desiring days to be designated for so many things. And the most important thing at times is left behind. So I want to commend you for having a day designated for this purpose. Praise the Lord. I'll be sharing a presentation, and it should be up on your screen, I believe, any moment now. Great. So, I will go. Tell someone, I will go. Touch yourself. I will go. I will go. I will go. I will go. Praise the Lord. As we move on, will you take the gospel to them? Let's have a look at them. There, there they are. I wonder who is that sitting in that corner? Any of us sitting on there? So the question is, will you take the gospel to those individuals who are seemingly having fun, seemingly partying and having a grand time? Amen? As we continue. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 39, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now I want to look at the fact that compassion, he was moved with compassion when he saw the condition of the people. When he saw them, they were scattered like, like sheep, having no shepherd, having no guide. They fainted, they were dying. So when the Lord saw their condition, he was moved with compassion. 
and he was now saying, let us pray. He was saying to the disciples, the harvest is plenteous. But of a truth, the laborers are few. Is that happening today? Is that happening today? But I wonder, can we change that? Come on, Bethel, can we change that? We can change that. God has positioned you to change that. Amen? And, you have to, and we have to make some decision that we are going to change that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Hallelujah. This was the sight in which he observed. And the next slide we'll see the sight that he observed. He observed that sitting up, partying, the reveling, the drinking, the smoking. That's what the Lord is seeing. When the Lord looked down now, these are some of the things he's seen. Praise God. So Jesus saw, on the next slide, a, a lost and dying world. What do you see? When you go to the supermarket, what do you see? When you walk on the street, what do you see? What, what are you seeing in front of you? When you see them um, um, having fun and shouting and drinking and smoking, what, what are you seeing, Bethel? We are seeing a lost and dying world. We are seeing a world that is so wrong, believing that they are so right. We are seeing a world that is lost and think they are on the right path. Praise the Lord. And that should add some burden to us. That should trouble us. We should not be comfortable when we see these things. We should not rest comfortably at night. So, on the next slide it says, two, two critical scriptures. Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 18, 11, The Lord said, For the Son of Man is come to seek, well, for the scripture, to save that which was lost. That's the purpose of Jesus coming, to save that which was lost. With all the sick people that Jesus healed, all those that he provided for, he gave them, he gave them sight, he healed them, they were able to walk and all these things. The greatest miracle was when he died on Calvary's cross to save mankind. Hello, somebody. I know he brought back Lazarus from, from the dead, but Lazarus died again. I wonder if you're with me. The greatest miracle, the greatest thing that he did was when he went to the cross and he died and he got up back from the grave. He paid the price for man's redemption. He paid the price for our sins. And that's why, so you understand the value of a soul. What is it profit a man should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I often ask the question, when you think about at the value of a soul, a person's soul is valued so much. If you can tell me the value of Jesus' life or the value of Jesus' blood, I can tell you the value of a soul. Did you get that? Did you get that? If you can tell me the value of Jesus' blood or the value of Jesus' life, I, I, I can tell you the value of a soul. Jesus saw a soul being so important that he was willing to lay down his life. I wonder if you're with me. He was willing to shed his blood for a soul. So a soul meant so much to him that he was willing to die. He was willing to lay down his life. So when we consider the value of a soul which we cannot quantify, and rightly so, we cannot quantify the value of Jesus' life. But one thing we can tell you, it is so important that Jesus say, hey, I will die. Oh, Lord, you didn't get that. He said, I will die. You are so valuable, I will die. You are so valuable, I will suffer. You are so valuable, I'll let them talk about me. I'll let them whip me. I will let them jeer me. I will let them nail me to the cross because you are so valuable. That's how valuable a soul is. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now we look at the value of a soul in more in depth. On the next slide, which says, there are three things that will last, will last for eternity. They last for eternity. God, the word of God, and the soul of men. God, the word of God, and the soul of men will last, last forever. It says a lost soul has tremendous value to Jesus Christ. It will never lose its worth. In other words, it doesn't matter what state the soul is in. 
the soul has not lost its worth or its value. No matter how deep in sin a soul may get, no matter how filthy he may become, a soul never loses its value. So the question is, how much value do you place on a lost soul? So when we look at individuals, we don't just see them as a person. We see them as a soul. And if you're with me, so I don't see them because of the amount of money they have. I see them as a soul. I don't see them because they are riddled with tattoos. I see them as a soul. We don't see them because they're a convicted criminal and a rapist. We see them as a soul. Hallelujah. We don't see them as a scammer. We see them as a soul. We don't see them as a gun pusher or a drug mule. We see them as a soul. When we see them as a soul, our approach to them will be different. When we see them as a soul, and not because of the money they have or because the skin bleach out. Lord have mercy. We see them as a soul. Can I trouble you quickly? I never want to trouble you so quick so early, but let me can I trouble you quickly? Are we prepared for souls that will come into the church riddled with tattoos? All right, let me move on. I, I, I don't want to trouble you so quick. I don't want to trouble you so quick. I don't want to trouble you so quick. But think about that. Are, are, are we ready for that? Suppose I had come today in a short sleeve shirt and you saw tattoos from here come down to here. Are we ready for that? Oh Lord. I know you're quiet, you know. Because we're not ready for it as yet, Bishop. But when we are focusing on the soul, oh hallelujah. When we are focusing on the soul, we look beyond the tattoos because I'm seeing a soul. I look beyond what the, the abuse that they have been through because I'm looking at the soul. Because the flesh will not live forever, but the soul will live forever. So our focus should be on the soul of men. Because that's why Jesus came to save the soul of men. To seek and to save that which was lost. Habushai, Hayasha, Jesus, Hallelujah, Hallelujah to God, Hallelujah. How much value do you place on a lost soul? How much value do you place on a lost soul? Jesus understood the value of a lost soul and was willing to die. Jesus was pleased to invest value on a lost soul in the in John three sixteen. He sent his only begotten Son. His only. So the soul is so important. He sent his only. He gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his. In 1 John 3, 16, he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. But don't stop there. And we are to lay down our lives. Oh, hallelujah. We should not be afraid, the Bible is saying, to put our lives in danger for a lost soul. Oh God, hallelujah. Not be afraid to put our lives in danger for a lost soul. Because the soul is more important than your very life. So, so the tripartite being body, soul, and, fle and, 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 and spirit. So the, the flesh goes back to the earth. The spirit gives God's consciousness, but the soul gives self-consciousness. And the soul of man will constantly live on. The soul will not die. The soul will always be in a conscious state. So the soul is that which will be conscious to, to go to the suffering and the anguish. That's why you put on a new body that you'll be able to withstand those who go to damnation, the punishment, not the flesh. Because the flesh goes back to the earth. Oh God Almighty. But the soul of man will live on. And so we are focusing more on the soul. So he's saying we are to lay down our lives for the brethren. So there should be no sacrifice too great that we're not willing to do for the souls of man to be saved. And Jesus was the example. Praise the Lord Jesus. 
Now let's look, let's look at this critical thing here now. Benjamin Franklin, where is it? On the screen. All right. Which has more value? The one on the right or the one on the left? Both are hundred hundred dollars. Both have one Benjamin on it. Which one has more value? Hmm? One looked like it just came out of the machine, you know, look crisp. And the other one seemed crushed. Huh? Talk to me. Talk to me. Huh? One maybe maybe, uh, maybe that one maybe torn somewhere, down tattered somewhere. Maybe somebody spot up on that one. They, Crush it out on the foot. Hmm? But it's still the value has not changed. The value of that not changed. Hmm? The value of both are the same. They are each a hundred dollars. The soul of man, one soul might be down in the ghetto, and another soul on the house on the hill. Same soul. One soul might be taking the bus, and another, and another, another soul is being chauffeur driven in the in the Range Rover. It's the same soul. When we view souls that way, it influences how we approach. Because some of us, at times, are very partial. Some of us are picky into who we want to reach. So we try to reach those who seemingly will give in early, or seemingly are decent, or seemingly are clean, seemingly intellectual. I wonder if you're with me. Seemingly work at a certain place that the income might be Lord Jesus. Only with me. But it's not their income, praise God, that determined the value of their soul. That was determined by Jesus. The fact that they were made, they were given a soul. Man became a living soul. Hallelujah. And when man became a living soul, value was applied there and then. <laughs> oh God, oh God. Because Jesus breathed into man the breath of life. And man became a living soul, an aspect of God which is eternal. Oh hallelujah. Has been deposited into man. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So even though man went astray, hallelujah. There has been a deposit into man that will not die. And that is the soul of man. Hallelujah. And the soul of man, amen, the value of that soul is not determined because it's crushed up. Not because she was raped. Not because he was raped or molested. Not because he was abused or convicted several times. The value still remain intact. What it needs. So both notes have the same value. One needs to be renewed. One need to be revived. One need to come in contact with Jesus. Now, you, the, at BOJ, if the note get torn or tattered, you can take it back, you know. Know that? And when they take it back, what do they give you? <laughs> they give you a brand new note. Same value. Hallelujah. I wonder if you're with me. I wonder if we can reach a soul that has been tattered. Take them into the BOJ of Jesus Christ. Mighty God. I don't know if I'm in the right church here today. Am I, am I in the right church here today? Take them into the BOJ of Jesus Christ. Get them deep in the blood. Oh Lord Jesus. Let them come back out speaking in tongues. And I wonder what they're going to be. Brand new. Brand new. Crisp again. Hallelujah. Anyone beat Christ? Lord have mercy. Is a what? A new creature. Oh, oh God. Oh. All things are passed away. And behold, oh Lord have mercy. Has become new. Glory, glory. We want to get that soul. Take them into the blood. Amen. Take them to the altar to get the Holy Ghost. New creature. Things I used to do, I do no more. Place I used to go, I go no more. Praise the Lord, because they are new. Praise the Lord, Jesus. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise God. And so, with the value of a soul, 
with Jesus establishing and knowing the value of a soul, we go to the next slide because now it says, so send I you. We remain on earth to finish the task before he left. Before he left, he said, sorry, as my father had sent me, even so send I you. So we remain on earth. How many of us had desired when we got baptized and got the Holy Ghost to say, Lord, me can't go to heaven right now. All right, you know what I have desired? Me don't want to go to heaven at the same time. All right, since you don't want to be honest, me don't want to go up at the same time. Same time, you want to get back to get yes, ready. Right, yeah, amen, praise the Lord. But we remain on earth to finish the task. That's why we are here, to finish the task. So before Jesus left, he said, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. And if my national superintendent was here, I think he's going to be here later. This is his verse. I don't know if he's going to tell you about it when he comes, but so send I you. you can ask, let, let him tell you about it. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Ask him about it. So send I you. Now go. He said, go to them. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the next slide. Go. Don't even know where that road takes you, but go. Like Abraham, go. And I will show you. Can you imagine the Lord said, go. I don't know where you're going. Amen? But, but, but the Lord is saying, so send I you. I send you to reach those who are lost. Next slide said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. He then said, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, Jesus understanding the value of a soul, and he was here, was here for a time, would not leave nothing in place for souls to be saved. And if you're with me. So, he spent the time, he prepared the disciples. He, he taught them, he fed them, he worked miracles before them, gave them examples, he gave them practicals. I wonder if you're with me. A good teacher gave practical, praise the Lord. So he gave practical, he sent them out, breathed upon them, sent them out. When they came back, he required request a um, report from them. And then when they gave the report, he also guided them and responded to them accordingly. He was preparing them. And then he said, it, it, um, let not your heart be troubled. So I'm not leaving you, but he said, I'm not going to leave you what? Comfortless. He sent them to Jerusalem to tarry till they be endured the poor from an eye. Hmm? And in Matthew 28, 19, he then said, go ye therefore. Because I'm leaving you now, so go ye therefore in all nations. He's sending them. He then, of course, in Acts 1, verse 8, he shall receive power. I'm giving you the power to reach the souls. I am not sending you to reach souls without power. Oh, God Almighty. I have given because there's one thing to be theory, to have the theory, but we want the practical. Hallelujah to God. There's one thing to preach, but we want demonstration. That's why in the book of Mark, I think in, in Mark 16, 16, he speaks of that. Hmm? Heal the sick. Praise the Lord. Lay hand, lay, hand, lay hand on them. The Lord gave instruction and said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Hallelujah. And so what God, what God is doing, God has now empowered you to reach those souls. He said, He said, Greater works than these he shall do. Oh, hallelujah. Because there are going to be some souls. They never had tattoos in those days. They never had drug mules in those days. They never had scammers at this high level in those days. But we have it now to deal with. And so the Lord has given you the power. Amen. To become all things to all men. The power to reach these individuals. And so the Holy Ghost is not limited by culture. Lord have mercy. It's not limited by time or space. It's not restricted by certain resumes or certain situations. It has no limits. 
He said, I give you power, amen. He said, and you shall to be witnesses unto me, unto the uttermost part. Do you know where the uttermost part is? <laughs> Do you know where the uttermost part is? Or what consists in the uttermost part? Lord have mercy. We're going global, hallelujah. And when they go global, you're going to see some things globally, they don't see locally. Oh God. But he's saying, I've given you some power to be effective locally and be effective globally because I'm setting you to the uttermost part. Because there are souls locally and souls at the uttermost part that need to be reached. Praise the Lord Jesus. So the church, the church, we must understand that as a church, our purpose. And that's why I'm so moved and encouraged by the signs I see around here. Because if we miss the purpose, we're going to be in serious problems. Many times we are caught up in all, sometimes there are disagreements, sometimes there are back and forth, there's all kinds of things. But if we focus on the big picture, if we focus on the big picture, if we focus on the reason we are here, if we keep the main thing, the main thing, mighty God, there are no limits to what we can reach or we can accomplish. Praise the Lord. And so the church exists for three reasons. One, to minister to God, that is relationship with God. This is expressed through prayer, fasting, worship, and Bible study. Number two, to minister one to another relationship with other Christians. This is expressed through love, fellowship, and serving. Number three, to minister to the world. Relationship with those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. This is expressed through evangelism, outreach, church planting, and missions work. Oh, hallelujah. This is the, these are the three reasons the church exists. Now, the first two reasons can be done on earth and also in heaven. I want you forget that. Let me, go, let me say it quickly again. Let me remind you of reason one. Relationship with God. We can have it here. Have it there. Relationship with others. We can have it here. Have it there. Relationship with those who don't know Christ. Have it here, but we can't have it over there. Everybody with me? We can't evangelize over there. We can't plant churches over there. We can't do mission work in heaven. We have to do it where? Here. And so the church here on earth, amen, have a huge responsibility to populate heaven by doing mission work here. Oh, hallelujah. If we can come to the place where we focus on the main thing, reaching others, we maintain our relationship, we maintain our fellowship, we keep praying and fasting, but at the same time, I'm reaching lost souls. I am more effective. And if I step on your toe, elder, I just tell you sorry, and you don't hold against me, so let's move on, reaching more souls. Oh God. But some of them, our relationship here affect our relationship here affect how we reach them out there. It affects evangelism. But if we can make evangelism the main thing, we quickly get over whatever isms, schisms, or issues and keep the main thing the main thing. Oh, hallelujah. Because you are now in fellowship down here and also in heaven. Oh, mighty God. And as a matter of fact, if you and I can't fellowship down here, we can't go to heaven. And if you're with me, praise the Lord. So, what is evangelism now? Evangelism is defined a specific ministry which is very important and essential to the work of a church. I want you to get this. It is a very important and essential part of the work of a church. Let me say it again. Important and essential part of the church. Just in case you never heard. Important and essential part of the work of a church. 
And let us just say it just came inside. It just came online. Let me repeat it for you. Very important and essential part of the work of the church is evangelism. Why else are we here? But to reach the lost. This is the one duty that Jesus gave to all of us. All of us won't be bishops. All of us won't be pastors. All of us won't preach and teach. But all of us can evangelize. All of us can be a witness. All of us can take this message to a lost and dying person. That is the ability all of us have. Praise the Lord Jesus. He says evangelism. Oh sorry. Jesus Christ ordained that this church would grow. And that the kingdom of God would increase through the ministry of evangelism. For church to grow is going to be through what? Evangelism. For the kingdom of God to grow it will be through what? Evangelism. So I see each one reach one. Praise the Lord. Evangelism is, a fir is first a presentation of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So when you do it, when you conduct in evangelism work, you are presenting Jesus Christ. Are you with me? You are presenting Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord. You are not presenting your intellectual capacity and how much degrees you have. Because I know many of us have degrees that even our degrees have degrees. Alright? But we are presenting Jesus. We're not presenting our melodious voices and our excellent um, skills and, and, and instruments. We are presenting Jesus. Philip went down to Samaria. Well, who did he preach? He preached Christ and him crucified. And if we are going to reach souls, we must preach who? Christ and him crucified. That is our purpose. The Bible says in, in Acts 8 verse 5, Then Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. In Acts 8 verse 12, But when they believed Philip's preaching, the things of the kingdom of God, and, what, and the name of Jesus Christ, who did they believe? The preaching of what? The kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. That is what he presented to the souls that were not saved. He you know, presented health, wealth, and prosperity. Mighty God. Hallelujah. He presented Jesus. And in evangelism, we present Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is the central, is the focus point, is the all in all. We present Christ. We present Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again. Evangelism, as we go forward, evangelism is the declaration of a specific message with a specific application. A what? A specific message with a specific application. The message that evangelism proclaims must not be confused, not, not, not be a confused statement of general terms, but rather a clear, concise, defined declaration readily understood. So we don't present big words and terms to an unsaved. Lord have mercy. You know, so look at the young man come from down a particular place. And you know, you can't even spell his name properly. And you're going to use some terminologies that you know he cannot identify with. Talk to me in here. He will not be able to, to understand. He will not be able to make any decision because he can't appreciate nothing that you are saying. You went to Bible school, don't bring up the Bible school notes. Mm? And show that you know it. I was a while ago. I was thinking. I remember years ago when I was in Bible school. So I think I was on a bus. The Bible school? No, I was somewhere. I was on a bus, and I, this young lady was on the bus. I was telling her about the Lord. I, you know, I'm just quoting the scriptures, man. Oh, the Lord has yeah. said so yes, and she said she know the Lord as well. So I was just quoting the scriptures, just telling her Jesus and Bible said this and Bible said that, and I said yes. And she came off at Dwayne Park. I said, yes. So when I came off at Greendale, like the Holy Ghost said, all right, what did you achieve? Because all I achieved was sharing my little knowledge. 
the soul was not impacted. I would have failed. Because the aim is not to show your knowledge. The aim is to get the soul to respond to Jesus. Are you with me? It might show my eloquence. I mean, I never show, never, never, never know too much, you know. But the two women know, Mr. Show, you know, I just make it loud when I two. I just ride it like you don't, you don't know much, but just make it look enough. The guy want to show up, say, no, something. Just make it look enough and so enough. You know, push it. Don't do that. Praise the Lord. I'm going to look at some scriptures later on that you must know as an as evangelize. So, you must declare a message of Jesus Christ. It must not be, be don't use general terms. Don't use, don't use um, vague terms. Let it be simple and easily understood. Hmm? Let it be concise. Praise the Lord. Evangelism is an exhortation addressed to sinners to accept, accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Evangelism is summoning of men to accept Christ as their Lord, to serve him as their king, and, and, and be, be at with fellowship with the church. That's what we're doing. Our aim is to reach those lost souls out there, that they will come in contact with Jesus Christ. They'll come to know him as their personal savior. They'll repent of their sins, they'll baptize in his name, they'll receive the Holy Ghost, and they themselves now begin to take the message to somebody else. Praise the Lord. Next, the next slide says, evangelism is the work of communication with men. We should be careful to note the importance of this point. Whether communication, without communication, sorry, it is impossible to reach men. We must reach the minds and the hearts of men and women, and they must listen if the work of evangelism is taking place. To evangelize, we take the message to them. So we might sum up the definition by saying evangelism is winning souls for Jesus Christ. With all that we read now a while ago, all it is is what? Winning souls for Jesus Christ. And can I tell you this? If a Christian is not doing this, they are not a true Christian, but an imposter. If a Christian is not doing this, they are not a true Christian, but an imposter. Hypocrite, false, not real, not original. Because a Christian suggests that you're a follower of Christ. And when Jesus came, what he did, he went for sinners. Oh, hallelujah. So how can we be a follower of Jesus and we're not going for sinners? We are imposters. We, have some impo we are imposters in the church. We are fraud. We're not, we're not original. We're not real. We're not true. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus said that they were looking for him. They said, I must be about my father's business. What is our father's business? Our father's business. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if we are follower, followers of Christ, we should be doing what? Seeking and pointing those to Jesus Christ that will save them. We should be bringing the message of salvation to them. Hallelujah to God. So I don't care who you are. I don't care how many titles behind your name. I don't care how long you have been saved. I don't care how much third heavens and fourth heavens you want to go up in. I know many revelation you believe you get. I'm saying, if we say we are a Christian and we're not doing this, we are, an, we're not true Christians and we are an imposter. 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 That's what we are. Fraud. Imposters. Hallelujah. 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 Help me, Lord, not to be an imposter. Anybody want to ask the Lord that? Help me, Lord, not to. Help us, Lord, not to be imposters. Help us, God, not to be hypocrites, Lord. Not to be, oh, Lord, pretending to be something that we are not. But help us, oh God, to be true. Help us to be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Hallelujah. 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 Oh Lord Jesus, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us, Lord. As we go on, hallelujah. I just believe that, you know, we have too many imposters. We can't be going through the motions, brethren. We don't say we don't say people, you know, but we can't be just walking past the unsaved and we are sweetly saved. 
You know, I remember when I just got saved, and it happened 20 plus years ago. The sister was in church, and a simple thing, you know, Bishop, she, the song says, My Bible and I, what a wonderful treasure God gave it up measure. I was a new convert, just got baptized, never had any Bible. And the young lady never shared Bible with me, you know. In the Sunday school time, the song was being done, My Bible and I. My, and she was, I remember like yesterday, she like this, and I was there, my Bible and I, what a wonderful treasure, God gave it out measure as we travel together, and she never shared the Bible with me, that's all, some of us be with our salvation, you know, I'm saved, I know what I am, oh, you, you, your husband saved, wife saved, children saved, and we on our way, yeah, I've got mine, yeah. Are you walking in, you're going to your office, and appear and save an office. I've got mine, brother, I've got mine. I've got the Holy Ghost, and the Holy, uh, uh, uh. And the Holy Ghost don't talk to you and say, there you have mine, but there's some for them to go tell them, no? I've got mine, brother. Imposters. Not being true. Not being true. That you find a well, there's drought, and you find the well. And there's drought. And you can't do the water, you know. And the entire community is um, dying of drought. The cattle are dying. Everything dying. And you, you found the well. And you keep the well to yourself. And the entire, you're wicked. You're big, no, wicked. No, we are nothing more than selfish. You're wicked. You're cruel. Because you have the water to, to help others. But you're keeping it for yourself. Oh, Lord Jesus. Let it not be among us, brethren. Let it not be among us. Let it not be among us. Praise the Lord, everyone. I know you get quiet. Sometimes when the teacher, the preacher teaching, you're hitting, you get quiet. Yes, so may I, may I teach then? He said, the fields, the fields are ready for harvesting. But there's a problem or two or three. Where are the workers? What? Some are shy. Others are full of fear. Some do not believe it's harvest time. Others are ashamed to be to being caught farming. Can you imagine? We have a handful that say we love to help tomorrow. Others claim it is not their responsibility or calling. Still others are claiming they have no idea how to farm. What will they do? The harvest is ready now. It, it, it excuses. I'm shy. Somebody said, it's not my responsibility. Can you imagine that? It's not my responsibility to tell somebody about Jesus. Can you imagine that? Something wrong with that life. Something wrong with that life. Some factors come because there are factors that affect evangelism. There are factors that affect us from reaching the souls. Fear is a factor. Fear. This is one of the biggest enemies of evangelism. This includes fear of failure, not knowing what to say, or of being rejected by others. The fear of man bringing it snare, the Bible says, but who say, put his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Anybody get that? We're not going to walk by fear. We're going to put our trust in the Lord. So people are afraid of being rejected, but Jesus was rejected. They rejected Jesus. Fear of embarrassment. He was embarrassed. Fear of failure. They thought he failed. Praise the Lord Jesus. Fear, fear of death. Amen. Praise the Lord. But of course, you should not allow these factors. But of a reality, these are some factors that affected us. Affecting the child of God from evangelizing and sharing the gospel. I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to, em to be embarrassed. And next thing, some, the, some more factors, people will say, well, I'm an introvert. I'm shy. Anybody shy inside here? Anybody shy? All of those shy, raise your hand. Yeah, I was shy too. I'm shy. I tell people I don't like crowd, you know. That this don't mean, mean I like them something here. I'm shy. But the Holy Ghost make a difference. Praise the Lord. The Holy Ghost grant you boldness. They may never know you had. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. Fear. This will be back to fear, responsibility, and rejection. Unbelief. Do you really believe the 
gospel? Do we really believe the gospel? Hmm? Do we really believe that Jesus is coming? Do we really believe it's one way to be saved? Sometimes our unbelief preventing us from going. So that will cause us to procrastinate and put it off. Hear what it says. It says, it has really been said that the reality of our belief determines the urgency of our witness. The reality of our belief determines the urgency of our witness. The reality of our belief determines the urgency of our witness. When I was, out, when I was much younger, young lady, think they never had any light, a little, little lad, and she had a little baby, and the candle was lit in the house. Juna came out and said, Simone, the candle caught the sheet and the baby on the bed and the sheet on fire. Simone did not move. He came again, Simone, the sheet catching the fire and the bed now being burnt and the baby on the bed. She never moved. Well, the bed, the baby and everything burned to death, burned. Because your, your, your belief to a situation determines your urgency. It determines your response. Your belief influences your response time. So because she never believed, her response was delayed. And she lost her first child to have to fire. Mighty God. Mighty God of Daniel, let not, our, let not be of little belief or lack of belief. Let us believe that Jesus is coming soon so it may influence our urgency. We believe and then we witness. He said, the shame of the gospel, we are the truth. And it needs to be taken to the lost and dying world. When they believe that we are the truth, Take it to the lost and dying world. Ah, I am not nervous. I am not fearful. I am not ifing. I am not butting. I know that what I have is what the world desire. I know that there is no other way to be saved. Mighty God. I know there is one way to God. Baptize in Jesus name. Anybody know that song? One, one, one. One way to God. Baptize in Jesus. That is the way to be saved. So because I know it. Eh? And I know they need it. I'm going to take it to them. Because anything else they have will not take them to heaven. Because I know that anything else they have will not help them. I'm saying, listen, I have to take it to them then, you know. Because if they don't get what I have, they are going to be lost. Praise the Lord. Next thing is not my responsibility. That's also a factor. It is your responsibility. Jesus said, go, amen, praise the Lord. It is all of us' responsibility. It is our duty to go and to tell others about him. Many times we say, let pastor do it. Let the evangelist do it. Let the bishop do it. Let the missionary do it. But so, somebody said, I will go. That is, this is the topic today. I will go. I must say, it's my responsibility and I will go. I am not leaving for the next generation. I will go. Mighty God. Hallelujah. Some other factors. And there was an example I wanted to share with you. But let me see what I can put it back in. Other factors. Quickly, let, let us run through this list. Lukewarm in relationship with God. Lukewarm Christian. That affect you from evangelizing. You're out of touch with the Father's heart. Those things affect you. Procrastination affect you disobedience that will affect you some persons are just lazy some persons are just lazy sin and carnality also affect you hmm? excuses i cannot speak well speech impediment or language barrier i remember a friend, uh, uh, this brother from church dennis richardson is, is his name the brother stut stutters a lot. By the way, I stutter, and probably you would know if I didn't tell you. But I stutter. The brother stutters so much that on his wedding day, he couldn't call his name. He had to spell it. 
put the call his name on the wedding day for the vow, he had to spell the name because he stuttered so much. Yet still, it never prevented me. He was one of, he's one of the most, the most he's, one of the, he's one of the wisest persons I've ever known. One of the most caring for souls. When he gives counsel and guidance how to reach others, he's never afraid. But he had a speech impediment. So a speech impediment is no reason to say, I can't. I wonder if you're with me. No excuse. Praise the Lord. Lack of biblical knowledge. If you know the word of God, how can we know the word of God and do evangelize? The reason we don't do it because we don't know the word. Because I was saying, knowing the terror. Knowing the terror of the Lord. We do what? We persuade men. So when we know the terror that is coming, we will not seek, we will not rest. We will what? Persuade men everywhere. Oh, hallelujah. Some of us have wrong priorities. That's also a factor affecting us. A lack of burden. I'll look at this. A lack of burden. A lack of burden is also an issue. Because many of us in the church, we have lost our burden. Hear what Spurgeon says. Spurgeon expressed that if sinners were to be damned, they should have leaped over our bodies. If they were to perish, they should perish with our arms around their knees. Anybody get that? Go again. He's saying if sinners are to be damned, they should have leaped over our dead bodies. If they were to perish, they should perish with our arms around their knees. He felt that no one should go to hell and warned and unprayed for. In other words, person is saying, I must stand between hell, Lord have mercy. Preventing them from going and positioning them to heaven. So if they go to hell, they must step over us. Step on you. Fight them way through to go to hell. That's what he's saying. Our co-workers must fight to go to hell. Bite us, thump us. Because ah, we are, we are blocking them. They're not trying, we are blocking them from hell. Preventing them to don't go there. Don't go there. Don't fight us to go to hell. Praise the Lord Jesus. He says the saints of God must have a burden for souls. If the church is to effectively evangelize, there must be a burden. Must be a burden. Must be a burden. He says we must recognize our divine obligation. Evangelism or divine obligation? Divine obligation. Not our profession, but evangelism or divine obligation. Lord have mercy. Now where you work, you know, I know where you work, give you the money. And give you the car. But evangelism should be divine obligation. The obligation doesn't come from earth and man. It comes from God. Divinely appointed. Divinely positioned. Divinely arranged. Divinely where you are. Hallelujah. You know why you're working where you're working? Because there's some person there to be saved. You know why you live where you live? Because there's some person there to be saved. You think so because you did well in the interview? No. Jesus saw some person that need to hear. And if you're with me, it's not because you're lucky you get one of them one that house there. It's because Jesus needed some person. So he said, I must, I must needs go through Samaria. So you must needs live where you live and work where you work to impact and influence some persons in your vicinity. So you are divinely positioned to impact your environment and pull men and women from hell and position them for heaven. Praise the Lord Jesus. It says uh, in in. in in, in the book of Luke, he said, I must be about my father's business. Luke 2, 49. Jesus' burden and vision and passion kept him working. When you have vision, burden and passion, you keep on working. You keep on moving. You keep at it. You're always on the go because there's something inside of you. Jesus says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Amen. 
Praise the Lord. It, because of the burden he had, why he says, I must needs go through Samaria. The burden sent him there. Some of the scriptures on burden. Burden was why he went to Zacchaeus' house and said, Make a son, come down today, I must abide in your house. Burden caused him to move from city to city, village to village, preaching the gospel. That's what a burden will do. Keep get you moving. And you can know a person has a burden. All right? Let me say all those who have all those who drive. All right, raise your hand. All right. All those who have a truck in your car. Don't raise your hand. You have a truck in your car? A truck in your car. Yeah, a truck with the gospel message in your car. Those who walk, a truck in your in, in handbag, ladies. Uh, men, you have a truck in your wallet to share. That's it. Ready to share. Ready to give. If you're with me, amen. And of course, the burden caused Jesus to go to Golgotha and died on the cross. Why should we have a burden? Because Jesus came to seek and to save we should have a burden because we truly believe that there's no other way to be saved. We must have a burden because the Bible says in Romans, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear? How can he preach? Let's see what's sent. Don't worry, we, we were all sent. We're all sent. We should have a burden because Jesus commanded us to go. We must have a burden because Jesus don't desire anyone to be lost. We must have a burden because it makes heaven happy. There's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. Praise the Lord. Again, why should we have a burden? Because we are the body of Christ. Because people who lost outside, of, people are lost outside of Jesus Christ. When we understand and accept that, we should have a burden. We must have a burden because men and women are going to hell. Hell is real. And no one should go to hell without a burden. Pray for a burden. If you don't feel it, pray for it, man. Say, Lord, give me the burden. If you readily walk past unsafe and you don't feel no way, it don't affect you, nothing across your mind, pray that God give you a burden. Praise the Lord, everyone. That's our old, that's our old duty. Now, let's, let's quickly move on. Because as a soul winner, we desire to be soul winners. There are certain character traits that we must have, certain conduct that we must have. Very, very important. We must have a pure love for all. Have a pure love for all, not just some. Not because of how they look, but as we established earlier, but because they are what? They are a soul. So I have a pure love for all because they are a soul and they are a soul that need saving. Hmm? So I have a pure love for us. So I don't walk in the altar and choose who to pray for. Hello? I'm looking for souls. And once the unsaved soul, that is someone to be prayed for. Soul. A simple faith in God. What's that faith? A faith believing that doesn't matter how far a person is in sin, they can be saved. Think about it. Do you know some of us sometimes... Think and say, boy, him tie up bad. Talk to me. We do it, man. Why she really tie up, you know? Me know it will work out. She have five children, she's not working. And it's five different gentlemen, you know. And the man she lives with now is not even hers. And if she, if she gets saved, we'll put it her. We start work out all the background information, like a William Jesus. So we start working with all that thing now and say, oh, this is not your business, that. That's not your, this is not your business. Our business is telling about Jesus and pray that the Lord save them. That's our business. Because who to, who to tell that lady may get saved and die next morning? 
Are you with me? But sometimes we don't have the simple faith. But if we are, but a characteristic that we must have is simple faith that the blood of Jesus is able to wash away the sin of every individual that repent. Every person that repent of their sins, the blood of Jesus is efficacious enough. That word means able to bring desired result, is able to wash away their sins. We must believe that. So we're going to approach a person and say, boy, in the God prison, he was a scammer, him full of tattoo, him used to do this. That's not your business. He's a sinner. That's a soul I'm seeing. And I'm trying to reach that soul to be saved. We must also have an urge to tell others. Being a soul winner, you must have an urge, a unction, a drive, a passion, a desire, an unquenchable fire to tell others. We must also have an absolute conviction of truth. We must be convinced that there is one way to be saved. We must also have a deep sense of, resp of responsibility. You must walk into a place. That is feel unsaved and say to yourself, you know what? If I don't tell it them about Jesus, they won't be saved. That's what the approach should be. The approach should not be somebody else coming and they will tell them. The approach should be, I am responsible. And if I don't tell him, he'll be lost. If I don't tell her, she'll be lost. And somebody's the first responders. So once you come in contact with the person, don't worry. If the if the seed have been planted already, water it. And if you're with me, if you're the first person to plant the seed, somebody come water. I pass, I plant, I pull, I plant a pull of water then. Because God is the one that does the saving. But something must be planted and watered before there can be an increase. Amen. The soul winner must have some qualities. What should our qualities be? Live a life above reproach. Not be offensive to others. Must be tactful. We cannot be individuals that are aggressive and combative. And just want to almost fight. In soul winning, we oftentimes says... Winning an argument is not winning a soul. Many times we strive to win an argument, but we lose the soul. Praise the Lord. We're not aiming to win an argument. We're not showing off our wisdom or how much we know. We are trying to win a soul. He must have infinite patience. You think about it, how much patience God has with us. How much time the Lord call us and we say we can't, we don't want to. But the Lord is still patient. Amen? So we must have infinite patience as well as we seek to reach others. He must be a person that is not easily discouraged. You can't be discouraged easily. You can't shame easily as it were. You can't be embarrassed easily. Hmm? You have to find a power and that might to push through and to be encouraged. Also, he must appreciate his opportunities to witness. Remember, I was talking to somebody years ago, and we're on the street, and some per we're walking through Spanish town, and some persons were, were calling to me. And when she passed, in January, I think she passed, she died. Young, your young sister. And she said to me, Whoa, so many persons know you? She said, Well, you have a lot of persons to tell, to tell Jesus about. To, to, to tell them about Jesus. So she saw the person that you know as an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. That's how we should see the person that we know as an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Praise the Lord. The, 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 the soul winner must be spirit filled. And I, when I teach, I often use Acts 8, verse 26 to 40. And it speaks to Philip and the, the eunuch. And how the Lord led 
Philip to talk to the eunuch. And also how Philip approached the eunuch. How he ran towards the eunuch. And how he started teaching at the, point, the place where the eunuch was reading. He speaks to several things. One, there must be an urgency. Two, we must know the word of God. We must also be widely read, knowing current affairs. Because Philip was able to start the discussion at the same place he was reading. So in outreach, we should be able to have a discussion where they are. So they might not be talking about Bible, but talking about full football or cricket. And yeah, besides somebody in a park, you must have cricket. So I say, not that you want to have in-depth conversation, but you don't want to just chuck it on them. If you understand what I mean. You want to start with a discussion where they are and slowly transition to where you want to go. And if you're with me, so you discuss where they are, and you prayerfully ask God to help you, and then you slowly just transition into the area or the topic that you desire to go. To tell them about Jesus. That's a practical approach. Praise the Lord. Very important. So, we must be led by the Spirit of God. Why? To use us supernaturally. People are not looking for a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. They are looking for a manifestation or demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost gives us boldness. Holy Ghost helps us to, to, to pray. The Holy Ghost helps us to remember. And give us the right words to say. Praise the Lord. Not all truth can be said at all times. Are you with me? So you know that there are Trinitarians. Don't burn fire so they're going to hell. As the opening statement. Don't call them tree God and fire you got hell. And you're baptized right. That can't be an opening argument. Hmm? All is once you start that, it's going to be a big blockage and discord and burn fire. I said, no, you must eat pork. Pork must eat. We know that. We know that. Bible says, no, that's that's for the communion. Right? Other says, as often as you, but anyway, <laughs> that's the communion. I often do that, but. So don't beat them and, and, and because they, they worship and they esteem one day above another and they say such, don't beat them on that. And so they are Old Testament and they were done to that. But you know where you're going. So you need the Holy Ghost to give that wisdom, to give that guidance, to give the right words to say. Holy Ghost help us to know the truth. The Bible says I teach you all things and bring things back to your memory. Holy Ghost to give you the right word at the right time. Soul winning, the soul winner must know the word of God as I'm coming down. How much time do I have? I'm coming down. Amen. A soul winner must know the word of God. Peter says what? Every Pentecostal Christian should be able to take this Bible and give an answer to every man that asks a reason for the hope that is in you. You must be able to defend this gospel. You must be able to present proof as to why baptized in Jesus' name. Why you believe in the the Holy Ghost. Why holiness is important. The Bible gives us true plan, the true plan of salvation. And there are some verses I have here that you must commit to memory. You must know John 3 verse 5. Who know that? You must be of must know John 3 verse 5. In fact, you must know John 3. Because the greatest, they call it golden text, John 3 16 is in there. Amen. And by the way, let me, as I mentioned, let me tell you, the greatest message was preached to one person. Greatest message was preached to one person. 
So we can't be motivated by a crowd. Lord have mercy. Hey, Lord help us. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. Mark 16, 16 to 18. Acts 2, 4. Acts 2, 38 to 39. And also others. And we must have thorough knowledge of Acts 9, 10 and 19. That these are conversion. Paul's conversion. Cornelius' conversion. And of course the, the follower of the disciples of, of, of John. We must know these things. So if you don't have it, write them down quickly. Give a chance. You must know these verses. There are others as well, but these you must know. Basic. You must know all the Acts, Damn John 3. Amen. So the soul winner, you must know the word of God. Because what you're teaching and preaching is what? The word of God. What you're presenting is? Remember we said that Philip went down to Samaria and preach? Right, so you must know the word of God to preach him. Because we're declaring him. Amen? Praise God. I take it out. We have that. And next one I think we have coming up is, is, um, is prayer. Soul winner must be a person of prayer. Let me know if I can move. Well, it's not up there. <laughs> if they can put it back up there so they can get the scriptures. Right. Go back so they can get the scriptures. So the word of God, it is powerful. The word of God moves sinners. So if you don't have the word of God, what going to move them? It is the only book, the Bible, that can irrefutably answer the excuse of every sinner. Most of the time when you use the Bible, it answers all questions regarding salvation or concern that persons have. When you use the Bible. The next thing is that a soul with a must book be a person of prayer. If you're going to evangelize and reach souls, you must be a man or woman of prayer. Because you're stepping into hell to pull man or woman out of hell to send them to heaven. That is no easy feat. You must be able, you must be praying. Because when you step into hell, you yourself have been, is been exposed to all kinds of things. Amen? And the Bible says you can't go into a strong man's house until the first do what? Spoil the man's goods, boy, buying him, mash him things. That's why you're going there. So we are going in there for sinners. We must first destroy his plans. Amen? You must have a hung, uh, um, the right words to say when you pray. That you must have a yearning heart, a heart that yearns. There is power in prayer. There is no distance in prayer. Prayer cannot travel. No wall, it cannot penetrate. No obstacle, it cannot overcome. Prayer can travel all distances, penetrate all walls, travel all distances and overcome all obstacles. Prayer is able to do that. So the matter of that soul is wrapped up and tied up in sin, with your prayer, chains can be broken. With your prayer, it can be set free. It can be redeemed with your prayer. Hallelujah. 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 Bible says we don't know what to pray for as we are, but the Spirit make intercessions. When the Holy Ghost begins to make intercession for you and reach for those and pull them out. Praise the Lord. I'm closing. A closing illustration I made. Mentioned it earlier. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So I won't necessarily go back over it. But suffice it to say, the urgency, the knowledge he had, the passion. And when the eunuch says, see here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? He was ready to baptize him. Ready to baptize him. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. In conclusion, D.L. Moody made up his mind that he would witness to at least one person per day. At least one person per day. One night, as he crawled into bed, he remembered that he had not preached to anyone that day. He got dressed. By the way, what, what would you do? <laughs> Turn over and hug your wife and go on to bed, yeah, man. I'm already in bed. 
I'll be retire, put on my bed clothes, brush my teeth, be there ready. I'm going to my bed. I'm going to sleep. That's true. <laughs> but, the, but he got dressed and went out looking for someone he could talk to. What a burden. What a passion. What a desire that he has. To share the gospel with a lost and dying world. That the man in his bed. First of all he made a commitment. He made a promise. That he would tell at least one person about Jesus each day. At least. And remembering Bishop that he never did it. In a bed like turn off you know. Dogs are inside. Good luck. You know them lock up there. When you're well locked. You walk and check all the doors already. You check the back door. You check the back grill. Check the front door, check the front door, all the outside of the outside, that outside line. Or the motion sensor line. You know that one, right? The car in the, in the driveway and locked up everything. And the, and the camera alarms, the camera turn on and the, and the alarm system on. Anybody know, them, know that? Well tucked away. But he got up. He got dressed. Interesting. He went looking. So at that time of the night, it wasn't easy to identify anyone to tell about Jesus. It was already midnight and the streets were deserted. He finally found a policeman still on duty and witness to him. I'm not really surprised a policeman is fine. Because that over the night, either gunmen or, <laughs> or security forces you're going to find out there. The man was annoyed and scolded. Do you have anything to do but to disturb me in the middle of the night? Trying to persuade me to be a Christian? No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on there, hold on there. No, 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 don't tell me how much Holy Ghost you have. You're not going to be happy. Get up out of your warm bed. Search for someone to tell about Jesus. And after you find somebody, the man ungratefully, don't that ever say to yourself, in the nose, I help me, I help me, I help him, you know. Scolded Moody. Ask him if he didn't have anything better to do. In fact, no. He doesn't. Because he saw sharing the gospel with the unsaved as the best thing to do. So he had nothing better to do. Mighty God. A few days later, that man got saved. So whatever happened after the scolding impacted that man. After he cursed and behaved bad, he, it impacted him. He never forgot his midnight encounter with a personal evangelist bent on populating heaven. Marco Shai. Halabashai. Mm. John Wesley once told a group of preachers you have nothing to do but to win souls Bethel Hashai you have nothing to do but to win souls Habakoshai we're talking to somebody today you have nothing to do but to win souls. Makosha. I know you can't sing. But you have nothing to do. But to win souls. I know you can preach. But you have nothing to do. But to win souls. Hallelujah. I know you're good at technician and media work. Art system, but you have nothing to do. But to win souls. 
he moody was interested in populated heaven as I close today where's your interest our interest should be to populate heaven our interest should be to empty hell and populate heaven. Empty hell, populate heaven. Empty hell, populate heaven. Empty hell, Hashai, populate heaven. Hallelujah. That's our purpose. Hallelujah. That's our calling. Nothing else we have to do but to empty hell and populate heaven. Increase the heavenly population. So I don't care who you are or what you do or how much letters is before or behind or under your name or in your name. Our responsibility, our calling is to read souls. Is to understand the value of each soul. And to reach that soul for Jesus Christ. Can you imagine, can you imagine if we have a hundred here. And in year one, everybody receive, will get one soul. Each one reach one. But you go around again, it's 200. Then 400. Then 800. I wonder if you're with me, then 1,600. In about five or so years, amen, we'd have to build, hit out here, take over there, get a bigger piece of land, and just use right here so as a preaching point. Or a hall for functions, special meeting. Now, Bethel, you're positioned, hallelujah. You have the ability, God give you the Holy Ghost. You have the vision. God give you direction. You understand your purpose why you are here. And you know the value of a soul. A soul is so valuable that Jesus Christ was willing to die for it. So I encourage you today. As you continue in this 54th convocation. I encourage you. I encourage you. I encourage you. You have nothing to do but to win souls. I want, I, want, I want you to hold that today. You have nothing to do but to win. The only thing you have to do is to win souls. Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Ah, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, God, help me, Lord Jesus. Ah, Jesus, Jesus. Oh God, that is your mission theme for the days. I will go. I will go. I remember Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah came in contact with the Lord, the question was asked, Who will go for us? First thing Isaiah cried, Isaiah said, Lord, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Hallelujah. But the seraphim took up the life coal of the altar. And placed it on my tongue. Hallelujah. And fire speak to sanctification. Sanctification. He sanctified the prophet. And the prophet said, here my Lord send me. I will go. I will go. I will go. I pray that as we... Go through this convocation that they will be have an encounter with the Lord. We will encounter Jesus. And at the end of it, it will not just be that we had convocation and it was good. But somebody will leave with a burden saying, I have nothing to do but to win souls. 
I am leaving convocation 2024. I have nothing to do but to win souls. I'm leaving 54 con convocation. I'm saying I have nothing to do but to win souls. On the 5th of April 2024, I am saying I have nothing to do but to win souls. I am busy winning souls. Let's all lift our hands to him. And, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, hallelujah, 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 God, hear, O oh Lord, the sound of our voice. Hear, O Lord, have mercy, God. Revive us. Place a burden on us again, Lord God. Hallelujah. Many of us have indeed been like imposters. Hallelujah. Many of us, God, have been so untrue to the calling and untrue to our responsibilities. Hallelujah. But I pray, God, hallelujah, that you place a burden on our hearts, a burden on our minds, a burden on our souls, oh God, I pray. Sweet Sweep over, sweep over, sweep over. Lord God, stir, 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 stir today. Stir up passion, stir up drive, stir up vision, oh shy. Stir it up within us, Lord God Almighty. You have positioned us, you have empowered us, you have gifted us, Lord. Help us to apply ourselves, oh God. Stir up all, every, everything that you have placed within us in the name of Jesus Christ help us God as we leave here we will not leave here the same but we will be charged and ready to go in Jesus name hallelujah in Jesus name praise let God. me hear the church say hallelujah can I get a better hallelujah can we just stretch our hands towards the teacher today with such authenticity, with such great charge to this body of Christ, and just say, bless him, Lord. Can we just stretch our hands towards him today and say, bless him, Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask us to stand for one minute. And I'm going to ask us unto the Lord, we're going to repent. We're going to repent for not seeing. We're going to repent for being imposters in the kingdom of God. For being fraudsters. For being hypocrites. For not, do, for not doing the work of an evangelist. For not doing what God says we ought to do in this earth. And that is to go he. Lord, today we repent. Lord, today we repent. God, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask that you will open up our hearts to your understanding. And we ask God that as we repent, that there will be a burning desire in our hearts to win souls for the kingdom of men. We repent today, God. We repent today, God. May our souls become so hungry. Oh God, may our hearts begin to burn within us. That we will not pass a soul that needs to hear that, ah, that Jesus saves. That Jesus keeps. And that Jesus satisfies. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth. For the manifestation of the sons of God. Hallelujah. We want to just thank Jesus today. We want to just bless the Lord today. We want to just give the Lord praise today. For speaking to our hearts one more time. For reminding us. For asking us that provocative question. What do you see? You first need to see what God saw. And that was the lust of a dying world. You saw the photos that the man of God showed today. He saw souls that were dying. Souls that were lost. What do you see? The question today is, what do you see? How much do you value the souls of men? 
And when you begin placing value on the souls of men, then we will get up and go. What is your line of sight today? What is your vision? What lens are you seeing through today as sons and daughters of God? What do you see? We've been provoked to go. We've been provoked to go. We're going to take some questions today. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We have over 300 persons online watching this powerful session today. And I'm sure their hearts are also burning with some questions. And persons that are in the house, you would have listened to this powerful teaching from Pastor Jones. And we, he's here for all your questions today, for all your takeaways. So I'm going to just open the floor for you to come with your questions or your key takeaways today. Do I have the first one coming? Yes? Come, Lady Marcia. Oh, no, you're not coming with a question. Do we have questions today? I, I believe Associate Pastor Jessica has some takeaways. And my brother, you may come with your question or takeaways. Come on up. Bless the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Now, in the presentation, it said, what do you see when we look into the world? And, you know, as children of God, while that was being said, I was really, really searching and looking. And as I can see, I wrote down that for the flesh, if we're Christians that are fleshly, we will see the things of the world and desire the things of the world. But if we see the world in the spirit, we'll see a dying soul. And so that is how we must see the world. In order for us to see a soul that is dying, it doesn't matter their riches, their wealth, or their status, or who they are. In the spirit, you will see a soul that needs Christ. So that was my takeaway from that part of the presentation. Thank you, sir. God bless you. So that was not a question, but that takeaway was most powerful. We need to see the souls of men as dying souls. Come and so say, Pastor Jessica, with your takeaways. Bless the Lord, everybody. Greetings, Pastor Jones. All right, so I have, I'm just going to share three because I have a lot. So my first takeaway was, it doesn't matter where we come from. Our souls are of the same value to God. A soul never loses its value. Praise God. Hallelujah. And then I made a slogan for myself today. And this is my slogan. I even love to do a little drawing, drawing thing in my book. So my slogan today from your teaching, Sir Jones, is evangelism, our divine obligation. So I think I'm going to make a little armband thing. You know that thing that they, we, they used to give us in, in VBS? And they have WWJD. And then the acronym would stand for what would Jesus do? So today, Jessica has written a slogan for herself. Beloved, you can adopt it. Take it for yourself as well. Because here, we are here to share evangelism our divine obligation and to close it off with this one i jessica stewart jones have nothing to do but to win souls god bless you in jesus name what a powerful share man we can always depend on lady jessica to give her powerful shares my god evangelism is not an option it is an can we hear that louder? It is not an option. It is an? It is an obligation. Sir, I'm seeing here on YouTube, there's a comment slash question. I believe it is from Dermot Levy. Thank God for the preacher preaching the true word of God. Thank you, preacher. One thing though, let those wonderful women be silent in the church. I, I think what the question is what are your thoughts on that as it relates to 
women and their voices in the church. Uh, we need that to be answered. Praise. Somebody saying, yes, man, go ahead. Let me answer it this way by giving a scripture. In John chapter 4, Jesus met the woman at the well and sent her. And the woman said, come see a man. Jesus. Is this not the Christ? Woo. My God. Say it again, sir. Come see a man. Is this not the Christ? I don't want to go further because we don't want to. But I want to say that that's an example that women have a voice. Absolutely. Right? Women have a voice. A very powerful voice, necessary voice, needed voice, and a voice that we'll always champion for and encourage on this side. Absolutely. Thank you, sir, for that. That was a powerful, good answer. Sir Snowball, you have, you have, oh, okay, you're just saying hallelujah to the point. Amen. I think the other question or comment to be elaborated on is the concept around that scripture in Matthew that speak to baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Can you elaborate maybe for some new converts or persons who practices that way of baptism versus in the name of Jesus? All right, thank you. Well, of course, it's, it's a scripture that first a lot of times, persons have misunderstood. Correct. But quickly, the Bible did speak of in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So we try to, we try to teach and have persons understand the difference between a name and a title. And so we need to know, ascertain, what is the name of the Father and what is the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Ghost. And there are several scriptural reference that will give support as to what the name what that, that name is. Now, Peter, as the instructor was given to to the disciples, and Peter was one of them that was there. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter understanding clearly when he instructed them to get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, I've oftentimes said that if I'm to consider two baptisms, the baptisms in titles. And the baptism in the name. Now, I am going to go with the one in the name. And I'm going to tell you why. Or one of my many reasons. Now, the Bible said no sin can enter there. Yes. So, once there is sin, you can't go to heaven. Now, there is no other baptism given in scripture for name. For sin to be removed by the name of Jesus. So, if the titles were, is accepted as baptism. Alright, let's say it is. And the name of Jesus is also accepted as baptism. I'm going in the name of Jesus because it says, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Powerful. So the only way sins can be removed is by the application of the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 4 then says, neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Praise the Lord Jesus. He then said, whatever in word or in deed, do all in Jesus, in the name of Jesus, giving God the thanks to the Father by him. He then said in the book of Acts, okay, you started me up, you could touch Jesus. Go ahead name. with the Acts. He then, then said in the book of Acts, all baptisms conducted were done in the name of Jesus Christ. There's no evidence of baptism being conducted any other way. And so, those are titles, those are not names, and those are the speak to different um, attributes are function of the one main man Jesus is the father of the Old Testament is the son in the New Testament came to die for us and he came back as the Holy Ghost living within us today Lord have mercy so that's how we, we look at it there are a lot more about time won't permit in Jesus absolutely I think you've answered the question most beautifully yes come on my sister sister Mullings God bless your brethren. What an excellent session, God even though I missed most of it. Oh, Lord. <laughs> okay. Um, the question that I'm going to pose is that 
think of us as people who are supposed to be workers for God. You said that, well, the Matthew 28, the Matthew 28, the Matthew 28 um, text that you mentioned, um, it's like Jesus giving his commission to the disciples to go into all the world. We are commissioned to go as well. No, we all have individual job descriptions to do. Peter didn't do the same as Paul, etc. I'm not going to preach, but I'm just going to just set a, a tone for the question. The question is, you emphasized the importance, the value of prayer in evangelism. No, when we pray, a lot of us pray and talk, 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 talk for half, half an hour and show, in the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah, and use all these cliches. We're good at apostolic prayers like that. Can you please emphasize for me, please, sir, the value of using your mouth and your ears in the proportion to which God gives you in prayer? The mouth to talk and the ears to listen in that proportion. Well, of course, prayer is a dialogue. Should be. It should be a place where we express ourselves to God and also spend time listening to God. It's important that we learn the voice of God and know what sort of instructions are is given us. If you notice the example that we gave with Philip in Acts chapter number eight, when the Spirit of God spoke to him and sent him to the chariot. From a carnal standpoint, he would not have known what was happening with the eunuch within the chariot. But then he learned, he knew the voice of God. And as a result, God gave instructions and say, draw near to the chariot. So it is important that in praying, we give time to listen, to learn the voice of God, and to get instructions from the Lord. That's very, very important. So, so many times we go down and we talk, as you rightly said, we express, we express, but he wants to talk to us. We speak to him, he, so, he also talks to us. We say, God, we want to go right, or we say, God, what way should we go? Bible said that, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of thine heart. And a part of that is also allowing the Lord to speak to you, get to know him. You think about Samuel that never knew, never knew the voice of the Lord uh, pretty early, and he had to be guided accordingly before he knew the, 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 um, the voice of the Lord. So it's important as we spend time, take time to listen, take time to meditate, and to learn the voice of God. We don't go by fleecing God. <laughs> I know sometimes we fleece God, but it's important to learn the voice of God. Absolutely. I see Lady Mullings clapping, so it means you've answered her question. Oh, right, Lady Mullings, all the way from the UK? Awesome. I have a question from the congregation. How does one go about sharing the gospel to those that know the truth but refuse to acknowledge it? All right. So first, as we expressed, prayer is important. So that's the key. Now you have to understand and know what you're up against. So you're up against a person that has a knowledge of God. You're up against a Cornelius situation. He has a relationship. This person can't say they fasted, they prayed. They can tell that they've seen miracles, and you can't dispute or discount that. Yeah. So the first thing, never dispute, never discount their experience. True. Never put down and let it seem as if they don't know what they're talking about. Appreciate their experiences. Appreciate their encounters. Yeah. Because yeah. some of us um, will get to know God in part. True. And they are actually on a journey to knowing God. They are just not where you are as yet. Yeah. So the first thing, prayer. Second thing, don't discount them. Third thing now, how do I approach the person? You have to find, first of all, that they are willing to have a discussion. They are open to have that discussion with you. Try not to bring it to a place where it's combative or argumentative. You don't want an argument. You don't want a combat. You want something that you can both have a discussion. If you are going to discuss, and don't have debates to prove. Yes. It's going to be wasting time. So if the person is not willing, if the, if, if the person that comes strong, you know those persons that, work, that worship on that day of the week? That day. Yes. All right. So when they come, they're not necessarily coming to learn. 
they just come to put, put across what they, what they believe. Yeah. They're going to find problems. They're going to waste time. But if there's somebody who is holding on but not too sure, ah, you can talk with them. You get them to express what they know and ensure you use Bible. Yeah. And you get them to read the word. Very, very important. Let them read the word. There is something about reading the word as opposed to you telling them the word. Word I speak unto you, they are spirit yes. and they are life. Amen. And there's something when they read the word and see that they should baptize in Jesus' name, it speaks, something is transferred. And I'm, I'm going to even say this. I am not, and please forgive me, I just think the book is more powerful than the, in, than the instrument. I'm sorry. That's my belief. I don't feel the book more powerful than the gadget. Thank you, sir. So I think it's good to get the book. Sit them and them read it. And let them explain what they understand from what they have read. And we know that no one verse will, will, will establish a doctrine. So there's line upon line, precept upon precept. So write through the scriptures. Find your examples to give support to your point. If you don't have the experience or the exposure to deal with it, Get support. Get persons to help you. Don't go and quote unquote lose the fight. Because you may lose the fight not because you don't have the ammunition, but you don't know how to use the gun. Yeah. And if you're with me, and if you lose an early fight, you know, if you get knocked out in the first round, it's hard to come back, you know. And the person may never give you an, 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 another, another round. Praise the Lord. So there are some pointers. I hope I would have. Powerful answered. response, sir. We're winding down. Yes, sir. Pastor Snowball has a question. Praise the Lord. I have a few questions, <laughs> but thank you for, for this wonderful session that challenged us in many ways. Um, I'll start with the first one. Um, sir, do I need to be able to preach and know Greek and Hebrew in order to be an effective witness, witness and um, minister of the gospel of salvation? All right, so, no. So let's look at the whole issue of effective witness. I'll give examples earlier. That there are some basic scriptures. We get one in Peter that we should be able to give an answer to everyone that asks a question regarding our belief. So, no, you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew. And then it kind of depends when, when it's a effective minister of the gospel. That's very broad. All right. Because we can go into. To be an evangelist. Let's <laughs> oh, Lord. To be a witness. <laughs> to be a witness. Let's stay a witness, right? right? Let's be right. a witness. Because if you go into evangelist, if you look at the pureness of, of the word, yes. it may be a bit deeper. But no, you don't need that. Mm. You just need to be willing. You need to understand, um, I started sharing the gospel, witnessing, um, as a new convert. Because when I just got saved, I dive into the word I was Did reading. you say new convert? As a, yeah, as a new convert. I was young, new convert, and I started sharing the, sharing the word at that time. Telling person, and, and, and he helped me. And I wasn't preaching, I went to public, and I did not know Greek or Hebrew. Still don't know much Greek or Hebrew. But I'm just saying, it's important that, so that they're not necessary. Have a grasp of salvation. How to be saved. That's very, very important. Okay. So following on that, um, yes. are you saying then that so I'm not going to go back on the evangelism, I'm going to stick to soul winning. Soul winning is not restricted to us gathering here in a mass meeting, big tent kind of thing. It's not restricted to that or is it? All right, so it's a good question and, and time would not have, not have permitted me to touch on type of evangelism, talk about mass evangelism, children evangelism, pioneer evangelism, personal evangelism. So we can pick two from what you're, you're referring to just now. And that's personal evangelism and mass evangelism. Personal evangelism is more effective than mass evangelism. Mass evangelism speaks to crusade, ten crusade. Personal evangelism is one-on-one. -on -one, and everyone is empowered with the ability to participate in one-on-one -on -one evangelism. So everyone should participate in it. It's, it's responsibility of everyone to, be, to participate in one-on-one, -on -one, or what we call personal evangelism we have manuals we have presentations that we, that we that we tend to give the individuals that they use as a guide to teach personal evangelism as we call our one-on-one -on -one, as we call it okay okay thank you very much um let me i'm taking them fast but <laughs> i know i'm asking some questions for some persons as well is there any value sir in preparing and probably that's what you just answered there too you know preparing various groups in our church to reach their own kind for example teachers to evangelize teachers students to reach students doctors with doctors business people talking to their 
own kind. Is there any value in that? In fact, there's great value. And if a church does that, it suggests creativity and also vision. Because you'll have individuals, and I know when in the presentation I spoke to more of persons who are not as intellectually savvy, as you I may use that term, but then you will find the doctors and the lawyers that will speak a particular language at a certain level. And so you don't want a doctor to be using a particular, a particular, ask a particular question or a certain word, and then because I just barely come out of high school, I just can't, and it, it is not discriminatory. It's just putting, play, becoming more effective and putting individuals at the right places. So I think if a church establishes that, it's a creative move to ensure you're covering all bases. So it's putting persons at the right areas. So children reaching children speak a certain language. Lawyers get saved, you speak a language, go back to the bar and get the lawyers. And that's not B-A-R to drink, but you understand, right? <laughs> The doctors, you send them into the medical field to speak with the nurse, and they can speak at that level. And they, so that's what it is. Communication is very, very important. So what you'll be doing there is putting persons into the categories for ease of communication and transfer of knowledge. So following on on that, my yes. last question. So as a Jamaican, yes. sending me into a space where not many Jamaicans are. There are other nationalities probably different, they don't look like me, yeah, white people, okay. um, but I go there and I carry my convocation service anointed um, <laughs> presentation of the gospel, or is there any merit in understanding their culture and space so I can present to them the same truth? It's, it's critical. I mean... If you're going into a culture that you have never been in, probably, you don't understand. Because there are social there are norms, there are social norms, there are certain things that, that they do. Not necessarily, it is not a sin issue, but it is critical to understand how they operate, to, under, to operate also within the remit of how they, 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 they do business. And then to communicate as well is very, very important. You're able to communicate. So, language barrier. You know, please don't send me to Spain. I, there's not much I can say, really. Come uh, tell you, I don't know if I can go further than that. But I'm just saying, I'm, I'm going to have an issue unless I prepare myself accordingly. So if I'm going into an uncharted area I, that I've not been before, I should prepare adequately to ensure I am effective. Because not only am I representing myself, I'm representing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. First impression last. If at the outset, I give a bad impression, Nobody else can come after me. Because my, uh, what I did may very well tarnish everyone else that's coming. So I think it gives merit to prepare yourself accordingly and operate within certain um, confines. Those were great answers and your questions were also brilliant because I know you were asking them for someone and to also break down the simplicity and the importance of evangelism when it speaks to I will go it doesn't mean the REAM team, the bishops, the pastors, because a lot of times we take it from that perspective. But the power of personal evangelism yes. is absolutely important for church growth. Sir, my question would have been as a statistician, if that's the word, what would you see so far based on your research? Thank you so much for asking those. In terms of our population, what is the ratio of persons saved to our population here in Jamaica? And maybe that would help with the gravity of why we need to go. Well, it's an interesting question she's asking me. It's an interesting question. And I'm sure the genesis of the question. It's delivered. Okay, no problem. All right, so my research that we did, um, we have about 2.3% of the population that's saved. My God. No, and that research is... Um, is very generous, as a matter of fact. So it's, 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 it's the research, the figures are higher than what it really is. And that speaks to number of persons in church. Now not, and we know not everyone in church saved. Wow. Meaning that everyone baptized in just in the Holy Ghost, I, I'm really living, I will make it. So I will believe that based on our research, we'll have under 2% of our population. Uh, we have 28 million persons we got about 64,000 persons saved so we are looking at about so our research said 2.3 but i would want to believe that the real figure might be about um would be under two percent 
of our population that has been repented of their sins, baptized in Jesus' name, um, received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and living a life ready for heaven. About two, so that about, about 50 something thousand. 50 something thousand of our population close to 60, yes, about. that's clocking close to 3 million. What, what, what a ripe harvest! What a tremendous opportunity! What do you see? What do we see? As apostolic believers sitting in a country, we never even talk about the worldwide statistics. As Jamaicans, apostolics, we are sitting in a country with 2% thereabout of our population being saved. Brethren, we got to go. I'm going to take one last question from our vice president of the ring team. Sister Wallace is burning to her. We're going to take two of them, and then we're going to steal five minutes and wrap for the next session. So come, Pastor. All right, come, Sister Wallace, and then Pastor. Bless the Lord, everybody. Um, my question is, how do we effectively evangelize to persons who are same-sex attracted? And I know that's one of the challenges we have because we often want to lick them with Romans and, and let them know that they're going to hell. But how do we win the soul? You know, as I prepared and as I prepared for the presentation today, it was difficult because of the amount of information I love to give, but the time not there. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is in the presentation is, are we ready for these persons? I'm not sure of a church, we are ready for these individuals. However, as Bishop was, was saying just now, it's a soul. And we have to see them, see them as sinners, a soul that need to be saved. And that is the, the approach. Now, we understand that they're exposed, they, they can be delivered. And we must believe that. And I think what affects our witness and our approach is that we don't believe. Yeah. All right, as Jamaicans, the first thing we say is fire. Let's talk the truth. Yes, Bishop. That we say we say burn them, fire. That's the first thing we say when, when these of these individuals. But we have to um, look at these persons as souls, and these are souls that need to be saved. These are souls that need Jesus. And so while it poses a different kind of a challenge, or it's a bit new in some, some sense, the blood of Jesus, as I said earlier, is efficacious, able to wash away the sin of every sinner that comes and repent so that person same-sex orientation they can be saved we must believe that we must believe and we have remember, to believe when we believe it influence our approach yeah. what we do we must believe that it can be saved powerful come sir see more my voice gone but it's coming back powerful teaching elder jones my question, I love the question, Sister Crystal Post, um, as you deal with a while ago, the fear factor, yeah. it attacks every person who really want to win a soul. Yes. And my question, I would say, say that because a couple of years ago was coming where well, COVID just started, was coming on the plane, the flight delayed, and I just feel compelled to say a prayer on the plane. Yes. Everybody start to look at me when I stand up. I said, brethren, I said, good, good morning. We've been traveling from yesterday and I'd like to say a prayer. Now I feel shaking about the spirit, bid me to pray. And the plane full, you know. That take a whole heap of yes. fit. And I say, I'm going to kill that demon here right now. I'm saying, how do we deal with this? It not only affects just going to preach the, at the pulpit, but every aspect of our lives. How do we get it to the young person, the smallest of person, wherever, whichever situation you are, wherever you are, how do we deal with this fear factor? Because I believe this is the key. If we deal with it, we have the victory. You know, it's a, it's a very good question, and try to address it by the, the presentation, the whole issue of fear, because fear actually cripples while faith propels. That's the thought I always have. Fear will always hold you back. Now, you mentioned the children. It's important if we get the children involved from early, they would understand that fear. But the fear, the fear is normal with us who got saved 
in our teens and early 20s. We are the ones that's fearful. If you get a child from two, three, four, and they grow up, see mommy and daddy issuing tracks, they just issue tracks. If they grow, so to conquer the fear where the child is concerned is to get them involved of ministry activity. Let them see you doing it. Let them do it. Let them grow up being a part of it. They, that will take care of their fear because they won't know any fear. Because they'll grow up in an environment doing something that is not the norm. It is fear when something is seen to be an exception and, the and, and not the norm. So you stand up in the, prayer, in the plane to pray seem like an exception and not the norm. So we conquer our fear. One is to face that fear, whatever it is. Admit that I have this fear, but face it and say, I'm going to do it. And ask God to help you to do it. Ask God to give you the boldness. boldness. Ask God to give you the push, the drive, the courage, the right, the right words to say at the right time. And after you do it the first time, I can, I can guarantee, you know, on the next plane, you'll pray again. Because you have gotten over that first hump. So most of the time when you get over the first hump, the first hurdle, you are open and you are more accommodative and more willing to do it. So face the fear, admit it, face it, put a plan in place to overcome it and pray and ask God and he'll assist you. Praise God. Sir Jones, we got to do this again. Can we just put our hands together for the man of God for this very powerful session? I had about five questions, you know, but I can't ask none because I think there is the point about the burden that we need to get for souls. And I pray today that our souls are now on fire, our hearts have been ignited, and we will make it our personal obligation to go. I know we're going to collect the offering, and I know we're going to come back at 1.30. But there's a push to pray, and I'm going to ask us to stand in this atmosphere, hallelujah, where we need to decree coverage and power and authority to go without fear to win the souls of men. God is still moving by his spirit. God is still moving in the earth. Signs and wonders are still being manifested. And so even today in this mission session, I'm going to ask our vice president for the ring team, Elder Rowe. I'm going to just ask you to come, sir, before we collect the offering and hand over to pass the snowball. That we are going to usher and recalibrate, hallelujah, and decree victory for souls in this atmosphere in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh God, if we could get some more. Hallelujah. God bless you, Pastor Jones. You know, I tell you this. When we bring them in, we don't have good aftercare. We sometimes kill them. I can tell you, I've experienced, I've been baptized many persons. Some people ask me, where them they? Like me, supposed to take care of them when you baptize them. We need good after care in our church. Let's not kill them when they come and let's not criticize them. And let's not put up barriers. Could we put barriers in our churches to prevent many from being baptized because of their situation? My God, but a soul is a soul. Oh God, let us pray. <laughs> You know, I said this to somebody in a conference week before last. The money that we need is in the fish's mouth. When you catch the fish, you can ask Jesus if you have him cell number. You call him right now. You can contact him. The money is in the fish's mouth. You stay there praying and don't know that that's where God sent Peter to pay his taxes and to live. Shama Messiah. God bless Pastor Jones. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we are not short of your word. We are not extortionists. 
Lord Jesus, we are not even agnostics. We are not liars. The reason why we have this convention is because we know you love us and we love you. And we know, God, that you have made us to come together. More so because your coming is near. And there are many souls to come into the kingdom from every aspect. Father, we come before you as Bethel. Yes, we repented already, but God, we repent again. There are so many gates, oh God, and traps and snares that were set up in the past to prevent persons from coming to salvation. We ask in the name of Jesus that these gates, these traps, these snares be broken down first. As we repent, God, of the things that we said in the past, that we did, that we have set up to prevent God. We pray, God, that these will leave us now. We repent. Wash us from the blood that is on our shoulders. We repent, God, on behalf of the words we said. Father, you came that souls might come to heaven. And here we are right now in the name of Jesus. Sanctify us, prepare us to go. We forgive those who have sinned against us also, God. Wash better, cleanse us right now in this convention. As you give us a charge, God. We are not imposters. Jesus, we are real. Right now, Lord, right now. Let every barriers that comes to stop the goal. Let everything that I set up to stop the church from going. Jesus Christ, every obstacle, you principalities, you powers, you spiritual wickedness in thy places, you rulers of darkness of this world, every agent of Satan within the churches, without the churches, we command them to be silent. We push them out of the way. We are going to get them in all of the world. Lord Jesus, Bethel, strategically place for this time and this season. Lord, let there be a new anointing, a renewal. Jesus, upon our children, upon every member. Jesus, that as we go to work, to school, on the bus, in the airplane, at the airport, anywhere we go, Jesus, we will be like a magnet that pulls souls to Jesus. Father, Father, we know we're in the truth. Give us a new beginning again. Let us to start again. Mighty God, we come again, the spirit of barrenness. Some of our churches don't baptize nobody. Some of our churches, God, it's not, it's, it, it's not even the king's business that must make haste to do, God. But today, give us a new vision. Two. 0.86 million in Jamaica. We have less than 50,000, God. Nothing to rejoice about. Nothing but God. We are coming up on the rough side of the mountain. We're coming. We will go. We will do. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Today as we stand here at the church of the living God. Who of Shanda 
Mighty God. Oh God. We, we bind the spirit of fear. We rebuke you fear. We hit you. We push you back. You are powerless in the midst of God's people of faith. You will let go those members. Let go God's people. We will be effective. We will be fruitful. We will be productive in winning souls for the kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ. <sighs> Father, we declare and decree that the gates of hell shall not prevail again this session. Even those viewing Jesus Christ will be motivated, will be touched. Father, let it be so. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Thank you again for this session. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have been challenged today by this session. Pastor Jones, God bless you. We have been duly challenged today. And as you take out your wallets and dip into your pockets to give an offering, uh, our speaker said,